Carlos Lacasa and Richard Barel uh, on behalf of uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructures for Arcelor Guipuzcoa and Richard uh, on behalf of Countercraft. Are you there somewhere? I know cybersecurity uh, counts a lot on surprising people, the surprise element. You have 20 minutes, right? Three, two, one, zero. Good morning. I first want to thank uh, the provincial government for allowing us to hear, to contribute with our experience and uh, our experience with our partner, Arcelor Mitar, Mital in Gipuzkoa. The presentation is ready. Countercraft uh, is a small startup still. Uh, we're only two years old. And uh, we work uh, with cybersecurity technologies. And here is Carlos uh, on behalf of ArcelorMittal. I'm responsible for IT infrastructure at the company. So uh, here we have a big fish, massive fish, in fact, and very, very tiny, very small fish getting together uh, thanks to the BIND 4.0 project. And it's a great opportunity uh, for us uh, being able to help a giant like ArcelorMittal. It's a great opportunity for a startup, for a small company like us. During our presentation, we're going to uh, break uh, a lot of standards and expectations. We will share this presentation. In English, we talk about deception technology, deceiving uh, is naughty, right? But deception uh, it has a long history in industry. I will then explain how deception uh, can be used uh, for in cybersecurity. We will present some case studies and, oh, well, our own case. Uh, so let me start uh, with uh, the tro Trojan horse. We all know about the Iliad and um, Greek mm, literature or history. Well, why uh, was that uh, attack, that offensive deception, successful? Well, quite simply because Greeks uh, were clever and understood their enemy's psychology after 10 years or something, something of battles, they uh, prayed tribute to Trojans, uh, the horse, right? Uh, and Trojans feeling very proud and full of themselves. Well, and you know how the story ends, right? So psychology, being clever, uh, is useful for successful deception. Let me go back in time, not as much, but Sun Tzu, uh, the Chinese philosopher, 500 in 500 AD, sorry, uh, before Christ, he said that uh, whichever party in a battle has access to more and better information will win the battle, the war, or whatever. And in a whole chapter of Sun Tzu's literature, uh, he talks about spies, uh, espionage, uh, both uh, as intelligence service services and counterintelligence services. Let's go back, uh, but only to the First World War. Imagine that you are the captain uh, in a submarine in the Atlantic Ocean uh, looking uh, at your periscope, looking for your enemy. You first need to identify your target, right? You also need uh, to know the, about your enemy's speed and uh, path. Uh, 
so that your missiles or cannons or whatever, uh, missiles in this case, uh, are successful and can hit their target. You first see the ship, that's a good start. Uh, we can calculate the speed, so I know that my torpedoes uh, should be fired in a particular, at a particular angle. And then uh, all of a sudden uh, you doubt, what on earth is that? Is that a zebra? That stripy uh, object? That's camouflage, right? Uh, and even more confusing uh, if you're out at sea. Is that a vessel? Well, that's a pretty hard question. Let us imagine we decide it is a vessel. How can we identify uh, their direction? In this image, I only have two seconds to fire my torpedo. Are they, uh, is there a path uh, towards me? Well, uh, it's deception as well by camouflage uh, to confuse our uh, opponent. Then there's the mincemeat operation, uh, the Allied forces in the Second World War on May the 2nd, 1943, and that's uh, the date for that operation because the Allies, the Allied forces wanted to evade uh, Sicily, the island. But there was a, a large amount of German troops on the island already. They decided for a disinformation plan. They got a corpse, uh, dressed it uh, as an officer of the Allied forces, and they left that corpse uh, at sea uh, by the coast of Huelva in southern Spain with uh, a letter tied to his ha hand, uh, supposedly with a letter with the plans of the invasion. Uh, that was their plan, right? That somebody would find the corpse and the letter and would uh, let Hitler know. And it worked forging uh, that conning plan and making the story believable is uh, very clever, right? And the operation did work uh, only because uh, they had all those resources available. And I would also like to tell you a little bit about this book, The Cuckoo's Egg, where uh, Clifford Store tells how an attacker um, was accessing a university network so could he could use it just as a jumping stone to then attack uh, the U.S. Mini military. And Clifford Store is a weird guy. I've watched videos and I know he's weird, right? But uh, he had this inspiration as responsible for cybersecurity. Uh, nobody would block access. Uh, you would just hide in a bunker, in a safe place. Uh, so uh, that's the way to do it, uh, getting that information, uh, creating a profile, and sending that information to the FBI. It took him about a year, right? During that time, he was so obsessed uh, that um, his wife divorced him. He was obsessed uh, with this deception operation. Once again, uh, the trick was accessing very clever resources, a lot of resources. Uh, and then there, there's this idea of honeypots. What is that? Well, uh, a machine might look vulnerable, uh, an attacker uh, might access your uh, equipment. And uh, logically, uh, when you scan, you find a machine, uh, you would then send alerts. That's the idea, and that's the technology uh, that gives you a lot of information. What's uh, the question in, that, in this case? Why is this technology not used? Back in the 1990s, uh, there were honeypot projects uh, for uh, cybersecurity. Why was that abandoned? Uh, well, 
simple reason for you to have uh, this honeypot operating in a company, uh, you need a lot of resources. We would all like to have uh, unlimited resources, right? And resources uh, also includes time. Uh, it's very time consuming just to maintain a fresh honeypot technology uh, with this deception technique. So, uh, let me jump again and uh, come to this day and age where our company, Countercraft, allows for designing, deploying, and management deception techniques in real companies and in ways where just about anybody can enjoy uh, this level, level of security and information it generates. So, that's a little bit of background. Now let's move to some simple uh, definitions. Why is deception useful? Well, you want to deceive opponents, that's the idea. So you can have also like a synthetic environment uh, so you can uh, monitor and study uh, laboratory rats. That's what we do, metaphorically. Deception also gives us an idea uh, of what our opponents or attackers are doing. Um, this idea John uh, presented yesterday, ca carpet bombing, in that case, uh, is like 30 different planes uh, bomb bombing a site. Deception uh, techniques allow us to understand why our opponents, well, what our opponents are doing and why. For instance, uh, let me tell you the story about a German car manufacturer uh, that was attacked and they immediately thought oh they want uh, the new drawings for the new golf model which are like buried underground at a server which is super safe so no worry you know no worries nothing uh, will come of it well after an investigation they found uh, attackers didn't want those drawings at all, but the automation systems, the manufacturing lines uh, at the plant. So deception techniques uh, can very often help us understand why uh, people or attackers or what they want from us. Threat intelligence comes into play then. in a way that's optimized for us uh, so we can really defend our system and so we can focus our resources. And this is how it works. Uh, we have a control center and thanks to an, an API, it can be integrated into the company's uh, environments. So we uh, set up different mazes and labyrinths uh, for attackers, rats we call them, uh, to get lost. We uh, prepare bait or breadcrumbs. It can be a document in an internal network, something that we think will be believable. So attackers or adversaries will believe is a real resource but is in fact isolated and completely outside the system. I'm out of time. Carlos, is uh, your time now. We want to present a real case to you now. Arcelor Mittal Gipuzkoa is part of the Arcelor Mittal Group, a leading player in mining and steelworks with some 1.1 million tons of steel a year. And that's not just one of our products. Uh, we also produce data. As one of our standard plants, uh, every millisecond, uh, some 50,000 uh, data, pieces of data are produced. How did we start uh, to collaborate, collaborate not just with 
Countercraft, but also with Mondragon University. The start uh, for that uh, was the Bind 4.0 program. And we love agile uh, methodology. We think this uh, step uh, is more iteration on our path. And we think that Countercraft uh, makes uh, their proposal makes all the sense as long as you're mature enough as a company in cybersecurity in, for instance, managing incidents or managing updates and changes, uh, managing new users, backups, uh, compliance, audits. And also, uh, if you're good at some basic tools and technologies, for instance, having a segmented network, firewalls, uh, prevent, uh, prevention of intrusion systems, authentic authenticating systems, because Industry 4.0 has new special needs. For instance, uh, connectivity of OT networks with PLCs, that's a challenge for us, which is why companies uh, should broach cybersecurity uh, strategies, remembering uh, how critical our sector is, that the 4.0 4.0 paradigm is complex, and also what might happen if there is an attack, uh, if uh, data is leaked, or if uh, production stops, or uh, if ma there are manufacturing uh, quality problems, or also even personal identity because uh, technology gets closer and closer to people, to individuals. Countercraft presented a proposal that uh, was uh, complementary to our standard measures. We, we just blocked whatever we thought uh, might be uh, malicious. And uh, thanks to them, uh, we can answer questions we hadn't even thought about in the past. How can I be certain uh, that there is or isn't malicious uh, activity in my network or in automatic uh, machines? Uh, how can I distinguish what's automated and what's manual and malicious? And thanks to that, uh, trying uh, to think what their motivations might be. Fantastic questions that uh, we, we couldn't even think about. This uh, rats, you call them? I, I call them gentlemen or people. Uh, in fact, thanks to uh, your solution, uh, we learn from them and that uh, at the same time as we stop them, and that's how we can add added value to our knowledge. In one of our more recent projects in cybersecurity, together with Mondragon University, We are contributing uh, our industrial experience to the project. And then Countercraft, the company, together with the University of Mondragon, um, they're designing a particular bait that uh, pretend to be certain components in an industrial network in a very realistic manner that will then be included in our networks uh, so that intelligence can be extracted in a potential attack. It's a very clever, very alternative way of uh, facing a cybersecurity threat. I want to repeat a message that has been mentioned uh, time and time again yesterday and today. Uh, but we want to say it as well. ArcelorMittal, uh, loves uh, being able to collaborate with public institutions like the provincial government, the regional government, or uh, private firms, like th in this particular case. It makes sense. Uh, we can't possibly expect to absorb all new technologies in 4.0 technologies, and we can't expect to just have quick wins uh, all by ourselves uh, for rapid response and implementation. We can also, uh, like that, broach 
a particular topic with a different outlook, different perspective. I think I can stop now and probably Richard can finish the presentation. Well, just in 20 minutes, I'm going to again repeat what Carlos has been saying. That's why this is called conclusions. First conclusion is that collaboration is the key. Uh, collaborating with the provincial government, in our case, or research centers. The second conclusion was quite hard to write for me. Here it goes. New security technologies can be applied and implemented in an industrial environment. Why? Because an industrial environment, uh, a production plant, uh, is more and more similar to an IT environment. And last but not least, again, the repetition of the first one, collaboration is key. So if anybody wants to talk to us, uh, we're just outside. Uh, come and talk to us later on. Thank you.